Well, something a little different for you on this hump day, ladies and gentlemen. As you'll quickly realize, I'm not the main narrator here, but I think you'll spot me pretty quickly. Now, more than two hours worth of stories for this evening, four stories in all, representing the whole of the Tommy Taffy series. Now, this originally appeared on Immunity Zero's channel, and as you'll see, it's got an all-star cast of narrators. See if you can spot me among them. <laughs> so, I know you like me being the main narrator, but just try something a little different for this evening. You'll have more of me on Friday. Okay? Well, my dear friends, sit back and relax for the next two hours. Because we've got some stories to tell you. And there you go something like this. My name is Matt, and my childhood wasn't normal. Not by any stretch of the word. Something happened to my family that is almost impossible to understand, but I'm going to try my best to explain those five years. Five years of my life I spent in terror. Five years we all lived in fear. Five years we'll never get back. My father, Spence, wasn't a very strong man both physically and mentally. He was the type of dad who often let our mother speak for the both of them. Now, he wasn't a complete pushover, but he often was content to just go with the flow rather than alter it. He worked hard and dedicated his free time to us, his family. He made sure our needs were taken care of, his soft assurances the unseen foundation of our family. My mother, Megan, was the head of our house, she was outspoken, independent, and extremely loyal to all of us. She loved my father's quiet ways, and even from a young age, I could see the chemistry flowing strong between them. My little sister Stephanie was a year younger than I. She looked up to me, and my father always told me it was my responsibility to look after her. We got along as best as we could, and even though I gave her all kinds of brotherly hardship, I did love her. We lived in a suburban middle-class community, a complete stock photo of the American dream. My father worked a respectable 9-to-5 job while my mother taught yoga classes out of the house. It was a neat life, organized and structured. Everything was discussed, considered, and acted upon as a family. It was a good home to grow up in, but that was before he showed up. That was before the third parent. July 1989 I was sitting at the dinner table, waiting for my father to finish cooking. It was his turn tonight and my stomach roared for his rosemary chicken. My sister Stephanie lay on her stomach in the living room coloring. Her golden blonde hair fell across her shoulders in waves and she looked up at me, smiling. She extended what she had been working on and I nodded, completely unimpressed. She sniffed at me and continued her sketch. My mother walked into the kitchen, pulling her hair back from her freshly showered face. Everyone gone? My father asked from the stove. My mother nodded. Yes, Spence. The house is finally ours again. It's so much better teaching yoga in the basement. So much cooler. I'm so glad that we finished the basement over this past winter. My clients are relieved as well. It's a scorcher out there today. Mom, can you sit down so we can eat? I begged her from my spot at the table. My mother turned to me and laughed. <laughs> Little Matt, the hungriest six-year-old this side of the Mississippi. Why don't you ask your dad to hurry up? He's the one who's cooking. I placed my forehead on the table's lip. Dad, I'm going to die. Stephanie looked up from her coloring book. Matt, don't be crazy. You're crazy. I muttered, not looking up. Nuh-uh. She said, sticking her tongue out at me. All right, all right. My father said, turning from the stove. In his hands, he held a steaming platter of chicken. Come sit down, Steph. The food is ready. I ordered my sister, the sight of the seasoned meat causing me to salivate. As she pulled herself up from the floor, my mother taking a place beside me. We all froze as someone knocked at the front door. My mother and father exchanged puzzled looks. My dad placed the food down on the table and told us all to hold on a minute. Groaning, I watched him walk to the front door. He peeked through the keyhole, and I saw him visibly tense. 
his whole body cementing like a statue. Spence, who is it? My mother asked. My father slowly turned back around to us, all blood draining from his face. His eyes were wide, and I saw fear dilate his pupils. He licked his lips and shot Stephanie and I a look. Spence! My mom pressed, her face contorting with concern. No, this can't happen. Not again. I heard my father whisper, staring off into the middle distance. The door shook as another series of knocks echoed throughout the house. My mom stood, her voice cracking with contagious fear. Spence, who is it? What's going on? I'm so sorry. My father mumbled, clutching his stomach, his face a pale sheet. I have to let them in. Before any of us could say anything else, my dad turned and opened the door. Dying sunlight blinded me and I squinted to see who our unannounced visitor was. Hi, I'm Tommy Taffy. It's good to see you again, Spence. I watched as my father slowly backed away from the open door. A man entered our house and shut the door behind him. My young mind was trying to make sense of what I was seeing, but even at that young age, I knew something wasn't right with this unexpected guest. He was about six foot and had a shock of golden hair cut tight along his scalp. He wore khaki shorts and a white t-shirt that said hi in red cartoon font. But that wasn't what caught my eye. It was a skin. It was completely devoid of pores. A perfectly smooth, creamy texture that looked almost like soft plastic. His face was a pool of gentle pink. His mouth a cheerful cut along his cheeks revealing a white strip of teeth. But they weren't teeth. It was just a smooth, edgeless row, like he had a mouth guard on. His nose was just a slight rise out of his face, like a doll, void of nostrils. And his eyes... His eyes were twin puddles of sparkling blue, shining out at us from his flawless, eerie face. They were wide, like he was in a constant state of surprise, and they shifted around the room to look at us in quick, jarring motion. His smile widened, and he raised a flawless hand to us at the table. Hi, I'm Tommy Taffy. It's good to meet you. I noticed he didn't have any fingernails or skin defects. No wrinkles or bruises. Nothing. It was like he was a living, talking, human-sized doll. Spence? My mother croaked, recognition blooming in her eyes. It's going to be okay, Megan. My father said voice shaking. Let's just be polite to our new guest, okay? The man, Tommy, cocked his head towards my father. <laughs> my dad took a step back, raising his hands. I... I mean, our new friend. The frozen smile never left Tommy's molded face. <laughs> there was no humor in his strange laugh. It sounded like he was clearing his throat or imitating a really bad chuckle. It was too pronounced, each syllable sounding too deliberate. My father forced a smile onto his face. I... I meant... He looked desperately at my mother who offered him no help. Her body froze in absolute fear. I meant... meet your new parent, kids. Stephanie, who was standing by her mother, frowned. He's not our dad. You are. And... Why does he look so funny? Stephanie! My mother hissed, gripping my sister's shoulder. Tommy laughed and walked forward to crouch in front of Stephanie. It's not nice to make fun of people who look different, is it? My sister looked at her feet, blushing. Tommy tasseled her hair. It's okay. Buck up, kiddo. We're gonna get along just fine. I'm gonna help your parents raise you. It's a big job being a mommy and a daddy. Sometimes mommy and daddies need help. Tommy turned to my parents, that ever-present plastic smile stretching his face. I help their mommy and daddies raise them. Isn't that right, Spence? Megan, Megan pulled Stephanie away as my father nodded nervously. Th that's right, kids. 
he did. Tommy smiled and turned to me. I was still sitting at the table, taking the odd scene in. I didn't understand what was happening, didn't know who this weird looking man was or what he wanted. What he was saying didn't make sense, but my parents seemed to know him, so I kept my speculations to myself. And you must be mad, Tommy said, walking over to me. I didn't look at him, training my eyes to stare at my empty plate. I suddenly wasn't hungry anymore. I could feel the strange man beside me, his presence filling my head. I licked my lips and felt my heart begin to race. I didn't like this intruder. Something about him felt dangerous. Tommy walked behind me, chuckling, his hands sliding over my slender shoulders. Oh, it looks like we have a shy one. That's okay. I'll help him with that. He said to my parents. His fingers dug into my skin and I winced, but kept my mouth shut. Don't touch him. My mother hissed, eyes going wide. Tommy looked up at her, mouth stretched. <laughs> my dad outstretched his hand, alarmed. Uh, don't be so rude, Megan. Tommy continued to stare at my mother, who nervously lowered her eyes. Are you staying for dinner? Stephanie suddenly asked, breaking the tense silence. The eerie doll man let go of my shoulders, one of his hands sliding across my cheek and into my hair. Oh yes, I'll be here for quite a while. And that was how Tommy Taffy entered our lives. At six years old, I didn't know any better than to seriously question what was happening. Even though my parents acted unsettled at his arrival, their constant assurances that he was a friend pushed away any lingering doubt I had. As the days turned into weeks, I began to grow accustomed to Tommy's presence in our house. My initial fear slowly receded to wary caution. I soon learned that Tommy didn't like company. Whenever my mother had her yoga classes, Tommy would pull her off into a corner and whisper something to her. I would watch all of this with silent eyes. I would see my mother's face grow pale and she would nod, whispering back unknown assurances. Then Tommy would turn, that ever-present smile plastered on his face and walk upstairs until the class was over. My parents told Stephanie and I that we were not allowed to talk about Tommy to our friends. Outside of the house, Tommy wasn't a part of our lives. I don't know why, but both my sister and I obeyed. Another thing I noticed was that Tommy never ate. He would never sit at the table with us, but never partook in the meal. Stephanie asked him once if he was ever hungry, and Tommy just smiled at her silently and stroked her head. During the evenings, he would gather our family into the living room and give us a short lesson on how to be a good person. My parents never spoke during these talks, just sat next to us, nodding. Tommy told us to not make fun of others, to love our friends and enemies, and always help those in need. He told us that's why he was here with us, to help my parents raise us. That we would come talk to him if we had a problem at school or didn't know how to handle certain situations. It went on like this for a month, and that's when my mother lost it. August 1989 my father had just arrived home from work and I was sitting at the kitchen table doing my homework. My mother was cooking dinner and Stephanie was practicing her dance for an upcoming school play. She was going to be a ballerina and had three weeks to learn a few simple spins and twirls. She had been diligently practicing over the past few days, but just couldn't get it right. She was young and her temper was getting the better of her. That's when Tommy decided to help her. He had been sitting on the couch watching her when suddenly he rose and stood behind my sister, placing his hands gently over her shoulders. Let me help, sweetie. He cooed, his voice carrying a cheerful note. My mother spun around from the stove and I saw her visibly tense. She didn't like Tommy touching us. She gripped the wooden spoon in her hand until her knuckles went white, watching as Tommy crouched and cupped Stephanie's body with his. He took her waist in his from behind and guided her arms and waist, his cheek pressing gently against my sister's. Tommy, let her learn on her own. My mother said, her voice shaking. Tommy didn't even look at her, just kept guiding my sister. I could hear my father coming down the stairs. 
Freshly changed from a day at the office, Tommy spun my sister and for the first time she nailed the twirl, her little feet twisting her body in a complete circle. Tommy clapped his hands once and then leaned down and kissed Stephanie on the cheek. Good girl. Don't do that. My mother shrieked, dropping the spoon, her face draining of blood. I jumped in my seat at the table and swallowed hard. I didn't know why my mom was getting so upset. He was just helping her. I also knew deep down that it was a bad idea to yell at the new member of our family. It was the gut instinct of a child, a gentle warning that rumbled in my head. Tommy stood. <laughs> my father was standing at the foot of the stairs now, frozen, unsure what to make of the confrontation. Megan, what's wrong? He asked. My mother's eyes never left Tommy. Spence, I can't do this anymore. I can't keep pretending everything is all right. We know what this monster is. We know what he did to our town and all those years ago. I want him out of our house. My father's eyes went wide, panic blooming in his face. Megan! He licked his lips, eyes darting back and forth at all of us. Don't be rude. Tommy's been a big help. My mom grit her teeth. Stop that. Stop pretending we want him here. I can't watch this happen. I want him out. Very slowly, Tommy walked into the kitchen and stood in front of my mother. He looked down at her, his perfect blue eyes shining like crystal moons. His voice was like frozen silk. Megan, would you come down into the basement with me? I need to have a few words with you. My mother took a step back. Get away from me. Get away from my family. You are not welcome here anymore. She turned desperate eyes to my father. Spence, do something! My dad raised his hands in a gesture of helplessness. I could see he was terrified. Stephanie was watching from the living room, her lip quivering, eyes watering. I suddenly wanted to go comfort her, but I felt glued to my chair. Come on now, Megan. Just a quick word. Fuck you. My mother spat. I gasped, heart dropping into my stomach. I had never heard my mother swear before, and it scared me stiff. Suddenly, Tommy grabbed my mother by the back of the neck, the smile never leaving his face, and yanked her to the basement door. Spence, stop him! Help me! Help! My mother screamed, helplessly trying to remove Tommy's iron grip from her. Tommy shot my dad a look that froze him where he stood. I I'm sorry, Megan. We need to do what he says. He cried. Stephanie was now openly crying, hands at her sides, tears running down her face. I felt sick as I watched Tommy open the basement door and drag my mother down into the darkness. The door slammed closed behind them. It was silent for a few minutes. And then the screams began. I had never heard my mother scream before and the sound of it shattered me. My father ran into the kitchen and scooped me up into his arms, then snatched up Stephanie and his other one. He marched upstairs into his bedroom and dumped us on the bed. We sat huddled like that for hours, none of us speaking a word. My mother continued to scream. Finally, long after the sun set, we heard the basement door open. Mom's sleeping in the basement tonight, Tommy called out. March. 1991. Two years passed. After that night, my mother never resisted or talked back to Tommy again. When she came out of the basement the following morning, I expected to see her covered in bruises and blood, but I could see no visible signs of violence. I was too young to understand what had happened, why my mother now walked with a limp and would for the rest of her life. She didn't speak to my father for a month, and even then, it was just enough to get by. I noticed my father crying a lot during those two years. I didn't know what was happening to my family, but I kept my mouth shut and obeyed the rules. Listen to Tommy. Don't talk about Tommy to others. Things went calm during those two years. Tommy continued to give us life lessons and be a part of our home. No one but my family knew he was living with us. He was our secret. The dark star that hung above our heads. I learned to smile around Tommy as did my sister. If he thought we were happy, he seemed more relaxed. But that night my mother challenged him, 
That changed something. Every couple months, Tommy would assert his authority over my parents. He would test them, stretch the limits of their patience and nerves. Most of the time, my father and mother would humbly submit to whatever mind game he played with them. Most of the time, he would do or say something to Stephanie or myself. It always made me uncomfortable. Sometimes he would have a soot on his lap while he stroked our hair. Sometimes he'd sing strange songs to my sister about love. Sometimes he would make us take a bath together while he watched. I always put on a brave face during these times. Stephanie was young still, so she wasn't as bothered as I was. It was uncomfortable, and I would look to my parents for guidance. With pale faces, they'd nod silently, and I continued in whatever activity we were forced into doing. It was in the early part of 1991 when the next awful thing happened to my family. Tommy pushed the limits once again. I rubbed sleep from my eyes and looked at my race car clock on the wall. The glow in the dark hands read 2 a.m. I could hear something in the hallway outside my room. It sounded like someone was crying. Where was Tommy? I checked the dark corners of my room to make sure he wasn't there, watching me sleep. When I was assured he wasn't, I pulled the covers away and slipped to the floor. I crept to my door and looked out into the darkness. I could see a figure sitting on the floor by my sister's closed door. A person. I squinted in the black and realized it was my father with his hands over his face. He was sobbing, his back against the wall. Dad? I whispered. My father looked up and immediately shooed me back into my room. I just stood there as my eyes adjusted to the night. My father's face was a mess of blood and bruises. Go back to bed. Ma. He cried. Please. I took a hesitant step out into the hallway. Dad, what happened to your face? What's going on? Did Tommy do that? My father's eyes went wide and he shushed me. No, no, of course not. Don't say such things. Tommy is a... He's here to help us be a better family. I walked closer to my dad and froze as I passed my sister's door. I could hear muffled cries from the inside. I could hear fear. Dad. I whispered, pointing to the door. What's wrong with Steph? My father wiped a trail of blood from his lips, eyes watering, anguish stretching his features. Come here, Matt. I crawled into his outstretched arms as something loud banged against the wall from my sister's room. I jumped and my father curled me up into his chest. I could feel tears drip onto my head as he fought back misery. Tommy's in there, isn't he? I said quietly. My dad sniffled. Yes, son. I looked up into his bloody face. What did you do, dad? My dad tried to smile, but his face wouldn't cooperate. He... he wanted to do something with your sister I didn't like. I told him no. As he spoke, I realized I could hear my mother crying from the bedroom. My dad cupped his hand under my chin. We can't say no to Tommy, okay? Remember that. My sister screamed from her bedroom, a shrill piercing cry that shook me to my soul. I gripped my father's arm. Why is he here? I whispered. Why can't he just go away? My father was silent a moment, and then he lowered his mouth to my ear. Listen to me, Matt. This is very important. When you grow up, do not have children. He follows those with children. I shifted my father's arm as something was dragged across the hardwood floor from the other side of the wall. My father grit his teeth, more tears spilling. We don't know who he is or what he is. He came to our town when we were little boys and girls, just like you and Stephanie. Your mother and I lived two houses down from one another. Tommy infested our street. I don't know how. He was everywhere, always. He'd be at my house, but also across the street, and also at your mother's, all at the same time. I don't know what he wants, what his purpose is. He just showed up one day. He just showed up and wouldn't go away. 
God knows my father tried. Is that how Grandpa died? I asked. I had never met my grandpa. I just knew he had died years before I was born. My father nodded. Yes, Matt. Tommy... Tommy had to teach him a lesson. He had to teach the entire street a lesson. After that. After that. Why can't you just... Just kill him? I whispered, ever so softly. My dad brought his mouth closer to my ear, his voice barely audible. We tried. We tried everything. We burned him, shot him, cut him into pieces. But it never worked. He always came back, knocking at our door. And someone had to pay. Someone always had to pay. If we didn't follow his rules, someone had to pay. Tommy was our secret. He was our invisible monster, hidden from the outside world. Deaths were covered up. Abuse was brushed under the rug. Because we knew. We knew if anyone said a word. Tommy would make it bad for whoever had to face his punishment. I digested all this with the understanding of an eight-year-old, and the only thing I could think to say was, When is he going away? My father kissed the top of my head. Three more years. The bedroom door suddenly opened and my father jumped, tumbling me out of his arms. Tommy stood in the darkness, his face perfectly composed except he was breathing hard. His plastic-looking face scared me, his two blue eyes glowing out of the black. Tommy jabbed a thumb over her shoulder at the now silent bedroom. She's gonna sleep like a log tonight. September, 1993. We had one year left. One more year. I could almost see the desperation in my parents' eyes grow every day, begging the calendar to advance. We were almost through the nightmare. I thought a lot about what my father had told me that horrible night in the hallway. I thought about what he must have gone through as a child, what he must have experienced. I wondered how bad things must have gotten for Tommy to murder my grandfather. I realize now that despite all the awful things Tommy was doing, my father's submission was keeping us alive. His agonized silence kept Tommy's wrath at bay. Looking back, I can't imagine the mental torture he endured during those five years. Stephanie didn't talk much after that night in March. I noticed her charismatic personality decline drastically, and suddenly, she was an unsmiling, silent child. I don't think she understood what happened to her, and as she grew up, I think her mind slowly began to build a wall, blocking that night out from her mind's eye. My mother and father seemed to be extra compliant that last year. They engaged in Tommy's nighttime lessons with added enthusiasm, and my mother desperately made sure Stephanie and I reacted in ways that made Tommy happy. But I didn't make it out unscathed. Tommy was sure to make his mark on our entire family. I was sitting in my room with the door closed. It was almost dinner time, and everyone was downstairs getting ready. I could hear Tommy laughing from the living room. I looked down at the magazine one of my friends at school had given me. It was a Playboy. We had pored over the pages at school, giggling and ogling over the naked women scattered throughout the magazine. I had never seen anything like it. It was my first exposure to that world. It made my heart race in ways I enjoyed and I felt something weird but pleasurable stirring inside of me. I had asked my friend if I could borrow the magazine and he had let me. I adjusted myself on my bed and poured over the nude photos. I couldn't believe women actually let people take pictures of them like this. I felt something stir in my crotch as I turned another page. My heart was racing and I felt hot, my cheeks flush. I was on the last page when I heard something from the doorway. What you got there, Matt? I whipped my head up, jumping, the magazine falling to the floor. Tommy was watching me from the door. I hadn't even heard him open it. N nothing I mumbled, snatching the playboy up and shoving it under my pillow. Tommy walked over to me. <laughs> I, I, I didn't hear you come in. I mumbled, blushing. Tommy reached under my pillow and pulled out the magazine. It's not nice to lie. 
I've told you that. Why were you lying to me, Matt? I swallowed hard, heart thundering against my ribcage. I... I'm sorry, I... I was... I'm... Uh... I trod off miserably as Tommy thumbed through the pages. He glanced down at me. Do you like this? I know I couldn't lie to him again. I nodded, my skin flush, eyes on the floor. Tommy smiled and sat down next to me on the bed, one hand resting on my thigh. Do these pictures make you feel good? I didn't look at him as I nodded again. Suddenly, Tommy slid his hand over my crotch and gave it a gentle squeeze. Does it make your penis feel good, Matt? I jumped, his touch scaring me. He removed his hand and chuckled, his strip of seamless teeth sparkling. Tommy put the magazine down and cupped his hand under my chin. Do you know how to masturbate, Matt? Has your father told you how to do that? My breath came in short gasps, his hand cool and smooth against my face. I didn't know what he was talking about. Didn't know what he wanted me to say. I just stared at him with helpless eyes. Tommy sighed. Uh, it's probably best that he hasn't. <gasps> it's a sensitive discussion I feel like I should have had with you, not him. You're what? Ten now? I nodded, paralyzed. Tommy slowly reached down and grasped my crotch again. Do you want me to show you how to do it? I squirmed under his grip. It, no, no thank you, Tommy. Tommy smiled gently. It's okay to be scared. Growing up is scary. You're gonna be such a handsome young man. He stroked my cheek with his other hand. One now on my cheek, the other still grasping my crotch. Have you had your first kiss yet? T Tommy, please. I cried, feeling tears begin to form in my eyes. Tommy pushed me back on the bed and I was now staring up at him as he cut my head in his hand. You don't have to be afraid of growing up. There's a lot of good things to look forward to. And just think, when you have children, I'll come help you raise them. It's gonna be fun. <laughs> let, let me go. I whispered, openly crying now, his breath hot on my face. Tommy suddenly leaned down and kissed me, his lips engulfing mine. I let out a squeal of panic as I felt his tongue slip into my mouth, his grip tightening around my crotch. His mouth tasted of rotting fruit and decaying meat, a rush of filth that invaded my taste buds. He rolled his lips around mine and then pulled away and whispered, Oh, not gonna get hard for me. I just cried, staring up at him with shocked, panicked eyes. Tommy smiled and whispered in my ear, That's okay. He suddenly sat up, releasing me. Come on, dinner's ready. Shaking, I wiped my face and let him help me off the bed. I wasn't hungry. July 1994. As the days marched closer and closer towards July, my family developed a silent, optimistic, a desperate plea to make this all stop, to make it all go away. My mother and father made sure that there was no reason for another hard lesson. They bent over backwards for Tommy, begging through clamped teeth that we'd all make it to July without another incident. On July 3rd, we woke up to find Tommy Taffy was gone. Five years to the day. We couldn't believe it. He had simply vanished overnight. We checked the entire house. My mother weeping tears of relieved joy that the nightmare was finally over. Over checking every inch of the house three times over, we met in the living room, embracing one another as a family. Tommy had moved on. The sentence was over. My father called out of work, and we went away for two weeks to the beach. During those two weeks... I kept expecting to wake up with Tommy standing over me, that horrific smile on his face, but he didn't. It was over. My parents did their best to rebuild our family, fill in the cracks that had been made during those long years, and I loved them dearly for it, but some monsters just can't be forgotten. I don't know what Tommy Taffy was or where he came from. I don't think I'll ever know. What was his purpose? Why did he do those awful things to us? 
I pour over the possible answers until my head splits and I find myself crying. The memory's too much to dig up. Some things are just left dead in the past. But I haven't forgotten what my father told me in the hallway. That awful night outside my sister's room. I'm 33 now and have remained unmarried and without children. I can't risk it. I can't risk that monster coming back into my life. I've never understood why my parents chose to have kids. They both had been exposed to Tommy during their childhood, so why have Stephanie and I? Maybe they didn't believe he'd come back, but I believe it, and I'm terrified. Because you see, yesterday, my sister gave birth to twins. Some of you may have read my son's account, third parent, about what happened regarding the monster Tommy Taffy. After reading it, after crying over it, I felt compelled to write this. I'm not here to defend my actions. I'm not here to make excuses. I did what I had to so that my family would survive. I knew what Tommy was capable of. I knew what we'd have to endure. But... I also knew that if we could make it five years without pissing off Tommy Taffy, we'd come out of the nightmare alive. How did I know that? Because I'd already lived it. I'd already been exposed to what that thing was capable of. I had seen Tommy's temper. I had seen what pushed his buttons. I had already done my five years. Like I said, I'm not here to defend myself. What happened to my family is unspeakable, but... We are alive. No. Instead, I'm writing this so you can understand why I did what I did. Why I chose to let Tommy do what he did to my wife and children. After you hear my side, after you read what I went through, then you can judge me. God knows I deserve it. Tommy first arrived on my street when I was seven. I was an only child and lived with both my parents in a middle class neighborhood. It was a mellow slice of the American dream, like a cut of apple pie under a smothering layer of vanilla ice cream. Our street was in a secluded residential neighborhood, in the far corner of our sprawling development. There were six houses in total, and we were a tight-knit bunch, both the parents and the children. In the summers we'd have cookouts, and in the winter we'd have Christmas parties. It was almost like our block was one big family. Everyone looked out for one another. Everyone was generous and considerate. It was a different time when people trusted one another. But our picture-perfect life shattered when he arrived. Jesus. I'll never forget it. July 1969. I had just gone to bed. My seven-year-old mind exploring my imagination, turning thought into dream. The moon was a warm slice of yellow in my window, an expanse of stars winking down at me as I drifted off to sleep. I could hear the TV on in the living room, a comforting reminder that my parents were still awake and the monsters under my bed would stay away tonight. That's when I bolted awake by a knock at the front door downstairs. It was such a sharp contrast to the comforting murmur of the TV that my mind went on full alert as the noise echoed through the house. I sat up in bed irritated, clutching growls, my teddy bear. I heard the heavy footsteps of my father walk to the door, probably expecting a neighbor. The familiar creak of the front door is followed by the muted murmur of conversation. I could hear my father's voice speaking, interrupted on occasion by another male voice I didn't recognize. My mother joined the conversation, and I could hear my father getting angry. Minutes stretched on as the mysterious late-night visitor continued to talk with my parents. I slid out of bed and went to my bedroom door, peeking my head out to listen. 
I still couldn't make out the words, but I could tell my father was getting furious. He started yelling, and I heard him demand that the visitor leave our house, or he was calling the police. It got very quiet then. So quiet I could hear my heart beating in my chest. Then I heard my mother begin to cry. It was soft. So soft, but it scared me. The nighttime visitor was saying something to my parents. His low voice and my mother continued to sob. After a moment, my father said something I couldn't make out. Immediately following, I heard something slam into the wall downstairs so hard the pictures in the hallway crashed to the floor. I slapped a hand over my mouth to stifle a scream, heart racing. What was going on? My mother let out a pitiful noise and I could hear her pleading with someone. There was a scramble of feet and then another loud bang against the wall. The intruder was saying something to my parents, his voice oozing with authority. I strained to make out the words, but it came to me in a jumble of soft noises. After another couple of minutes of agonizing fear, I heard my father call down for me. Spence? My heart was a wild drumbeat on my chest and I bit my lip, hand shaking. Why did he want me? What was happening? My father called again, his voice trembling slightly. Spence? Slowly, I pulled the door to my bedroom open and walked to the edge of the stairs. I realized I was clutching growls, my teddy bear. My palms were sweaty and I could feel the soft fur growing damp. I looked down the stairs to the front door and I froze, eyes going wide. My father was gripping his throat, wincing, tears in his eyes, something I had never seen before. My mother had her arms wrapped around herself, moisture staining her cheeks. But that wasn't what captured my attention. It was the stranger standing next to my parents, staring up at me. He was in his early thirties and wore a white t-shirt that read in red font, Hi. His hair was blonde and cut short. His two blue eyes pools of glowing brilliance set in a sea of snow. And then I noticed the oddities of this intruder. His skin was impossibly smooth, a clean pink sheen of absolute perfection. His nose wasn't so much a nose as it was a nub jutting out of his face. His lips were twisted in a smile revealing white strips where his teeth should have been. Hi, Spence. He caught up to me, his voice cheerful. I'm Tommy Taffy. I'm going to be staying with you for a while. I clutched growls to my chest, quivering, begging my parents for guidance. Instead, they cast their eyes to the floor, clearly shaken. I didn't know what was happening, what had been said between them, but I could feel danger in the air, thick and malicious. Come down here so I can get a good look at you, Tommy said, waving me forward. My father's eyes suddenly met mine and I gulped. Even at that age, I could interpret the look he passed on to me. Be careful, son. Cautiously, I walked down the stairs, never letting go of my bear. When I reached the foot of the stairs, my mother reached out for me. Tommy stepped in front of me, smiling down at me. He squatted down and ruffled my hair, his immaculate skin looking almost polished and waxed at this proximity. Cute little fella, aren't you? Oh, what's that you got? He asked, gesturing to my bear. His name is Growls. I stammered. Tommy grinned. <laughs> of course he is. I'm going to help your parents for a while, so I'd like the three of us to be friends. Me, you, and Growls. You think that'd be okay? Again, I looked at my parents for help, confused and shaken. I had no idea what was going on, who this was, why my parents looked so scared. He seemed nice enough, but the way my father rubbed his throat told me otherwise. <laughs> boo boo! Tommy chuckled knocking gently on my head. Hey, I asked you a question, Spence. What did you do to my daddy? I whispered, immediately wishing I hadn't. Tommy's mouth remained a frozen smile, but his eyes darkened ever so slightly. <laughs> my father reached out and grasped my shoulder. 
Spence, the son, it's okay. I'll talk to you later about it. For now, Tommy is going to... He's going to... He shot a look at my mother. He's going to stay with us. And that was the start of a five-year stretch I could never forget. A few days passed and soon I learned through whispered inquiries that Tommy Taffy had visited everyone on our street. He was in our home, but also in theirs. I learned this from my eventual wife, Megan, who lived across the street from me. She told me that some strange guy was living in their house. After she described him, I deducted it was one of the same. Tommy Taffy. I didn't understand how it was possible, but knew to keep my mouth shut. Tommy had sworn me to secrecy. He swore everyone to secrecy. This was enforced by my parents, who told me in hushed whispers to never tell anyone about Tommy. I could tell everyone feared him. I did too. There's something unsettling about his constant smile, his slightly off features, and the cool, enunciated way he spoke and laughed. I didn't know what he had told my parents to keep them from going to the police, why they were allowing him to live in our home, but it must have been terrible. We were a hostage in our own house. Of course, Tommy didn't keep us there, but we knew he would be waiting once we came back. At night, Tommy would sit us down and give us life lessons. He would tell us how to be good people, how to love one another. I remember one time during the first week, I looked out my front window across the street into Megan's living room. I saw Tommy there, speaking to her family on the couch. The Tommy in front of my family stopped speaking immediately and stared long and hard at me. Then he went to the window and closed the curtains before continuing. During the evenings, as the fathers on our street came home from work, I'd see them meet briefly in the road muttering to each other and casting looks over their shoulders. There was a mutual terror shared between them and unspoken knowledge that they had to keep Tommy a secret, that getting the police involved would only lead to, well, nothing good. I imagine upon arrival that Tommy threatened our family and then shown some sort of physical dominance over the men. I remember the banging against the walls and the way my father had gripped his throat. But what the hell had he said to them? Why do they allow him to infest our homes? Well, a month later I found out. They were plotting against Tommy. They were going to kill him. August 1969. Again, I was awoken from slumber. I looked at my Spider-Man clock and saw it was after midnight. I scrubbed sleep from my eyes, grasping in the dark for growls. As I found my bear, I heard banging from downstairs along with several voices. I slipped out of bed and went to my door. The lights downstairs were off, but I saw beams of light cutting through the black. Flashlights? I called out for my parents, but saw their bedroom doors wide open. I knew they weren't in bed then. More voices from downstairs followed, along with scraping across the hardwood floors. I jumped as a bang shook the night, and then the voices faded. There's people going into the basement, I thought frightened. Our basement was unfinished and an expanse of empty cement. Why are they going into the basement? I thought. Silently, assuming my parents were down there, I crept to the first floor, clutching growls to my chest. Sure enough, the basement door was open and I saw a light reflecting off the dusty floor. I could hear my father's voice and then the familiar voices of our neighbors. They were speaking to someone. They were angry. My heart froze in my chest as someone laughed from the depths of the cellar. <laughs> Making sure not to make a sound, I slunk to the open door and descended the first two steps to look out at the scene below me. Tommy was bound to a metal chair in the middle of the room, surrounded by the six pairs of parents that lived in our neighborhood. Their backs were to me, but I could see Tommy's flawless face gazing up at them. Megan's father was there. His face was a mess of bruises and swollen flesh. His arm was in a sling and it looked like his shoulders slumped like his back was in pain. I sucked in a breath as I realized one of the men was passing my father a pistol. The women stood by their husbands with grim looks on their faces. 
There was no disagreement among the executioners. It's time you leave our lives, one of the men said, looming over Tommy. I recognized him as my friend Luke's father. They lived two houses down. This is your last chance, he growled. Tommy didn't even struggle in his rope bindings, that ever-present smile still on his face. He looked up at them, the overhead light illuminating his sparkling blue eyes. I don't understand. I'm just trying to help all of you raise your children properly. I'm not going anywhere. I looked past between the parents and then my father put the gun to Tommy's head. You're not helping anyone. You're a monster. You can't come into our homes and threaten our children, threaten our lives. That's not how this works. All those threats you whispered to us while we were caught off guard. Well, look at you now. <clears throat> my father spat on him. Pathetic. And now you'll get yours. <laughs> My father shot him in the head. The report was deafening and I almost screamed, slamming my hand over my mouth at the last second. Tommy's head whipped back at the smell of gun smoke spiked the air. It was silent for a moment. And then... <laughs> in horror, I watched as Tommy slowly raised his head to stare back at my father. What the hell? One of the women breathed, her voice shaken. There was no blood, no shatter of bone, nothing. Just a dark circle in Tommy's forehead where the bullet had passed. What the fuck are you? Someone whispered. Tommy's eyes spun to the man who had spoken. I'm Tommy Taffy, and I'm not going anywhere. My mother suddenly pointed to the corner of the room, her hand trembling. Gas. Get the gas. Megan's mother went to the far corner of the room and picked up a small red can. I could hear the slosh of gasoline and I smelt it in the air. My father grabbed the can from her hand, his eyes wide and never leaving Tommy. Without a word, he upended it over the bound man, soaking him. Tommy kept smiling. <laughs> Another father passed my dad a box of matches. My father struck one, his hand hovering in the air. Go back to hell and leave us alone! Tommy grinned wider. Hell is gonna seem like a fantasy when I come back for you. My father dropped the match and Tommy burst into flames. He didn't scream. He didn't thrash. He simply burned. As his face began to melt, his eyes shifted and suddenly he saw me. <laughs> Heart exploding in my throat, I fled back to my room, tears streaming down my face. From the safety of my bed, I eventually heard the neighbors leaving, relief in their voices. Two weeks later, Tommy came back. September 1969. We were eating supper, a sense of normalcy returning to our home. My parents never told me that they had murdered Tommy, instead opting to inform me that his visit was over and he went back home. I still caught whiffs of gasoline about our house, but kept my mouth shut. I was just happy my family was okay. The sun was setting and the dying orange light filtered in through the living room window, stretching out across the floor to cover the dinner table. My mother and father sat at opposite ends of the table, chatting about their days. I could tell they were still shaken, but I admired the way they were trying to return their lives to what it had been before Tommy showed up. As I shoveled mashed potatoes into my mouth, I spun around, jumping as the wood splintered and the hinges creaked. I dropped my fork, eyes growing wide. It was Tommy, and he looked furious. My parents' mouths dropped in unison, but before they could speak, Tommy marched towards us with alarming speed and up into the kitchen table. Dishes filled with food shattered to the floor, and my father half rose, fear paralyzing him. Without a word, Tommy grabbed my father by the neck and dragged him to the wall where he plowed his face through the sheet rock. My mother screamed and ran to aid my dad, but Tommy spun on her and punched her in the teeth, sending her crashing to the floor. Feeling my bladder go, panic clawing at my throat, I watched as Tommy pulled my father's bloody head from the wall. Sputtering, dazed, my father tried to release himself from Tommy's iron grip, but 
It did no good. His eyes dark and his mouth clamped in a snarl. Tommy clamped a hand over my father's throat and dragged him into the living room. Without stopping, he threw him through the window and out into the front yard. I was a mess of tears and terror, snot bubbling from my nose as Tommy turned back to my mother and I. Now he was smiling. He went to my stunned mother and hauled her up. You're gonna need to see this, he said darkly. His lips curled in a grin. He looked at me and jerked his head towards the door. Come on, Spence. You too. He pulled my mother to the front door and pushed her outside. I hadn't moved. My face frozen in a silent scream. Tommy looked over his shoulder and winked at me. Don't make me ask again, sport. Oh, and bring that broom behind you. Pulled off my chair by fear, I got up and dutifully grabbed the kitchen broom and walked it to Tommy. My pants reeking of urine. Tommy put a hand on my shoulder and guided me outside to stand by our mailbox. I saw my father rolling in the grass, a mess of blood and glass. My mother kneeling before him, weeping. Our neighbors were coming out of their houses, eyes wide. Shocked looks of horror on their faces as they saw Tommy. Gather round, he yelled, motioning them to come closer. Look at what you've done. I saw Megan at her doorstep across the street, face a pale sheet of snow. She looked at me and I saw her begin to cry, burying her face in her hands, shocked into obedience. Our neighbors came and stood around our tiny front lawn by the street, all eyes on my father and mother. This is your fault, Tommy said, meeting every one of their terrified faces. He suddenly snatched the broom from my hands. In one quick motion, he snapped the head off, tossed the duster aside, and advanced on my father gripping the splintered pole. My mother screamed and covered her bleeding husband with her body, but Tommy booted her in the face, wrenching my heart in the process. Up you go, Tommy growled pulling my father up by the hair onto his knees, glass jutting from his face. My father looked up at Tommy, agony burning in his eyes. Don't worry. I'll take good care of your son, Tommy whispered. He raised the broken broom over his head like a spear and slammed it into my father's mouth, down his throat until it erupted from his stomach and plunged into the earth. Blood shot like a geyser out of my father and splattered Tommy's perfect features. My mother howled, her bloodshot eyes rattling in their sockets as my father gasped, and then died. His lips wrapping around the broom handle, jutting from his mouth. The neighbors watching were paralyzed, a few of the women crying out at the sudden display of brutal violence. The men's faces were pale and shocked into silence, Megan's father leaning over and emptying his stomach onto the road, blood dripping from his face. Tommy turned to face them. Eyes alight. I want you to think about this moment the next time you want to have a bonfire. Do I make myself crystal clear? All eyes trained to the impelled figure of my father, penned to the earth. I said, do I make myself clear? Tommy repeated, the smile dropping from his face. Everyone slowly nodded, every eye wet with tears and wide with terror. Tommy threw a thumb over his shoulder. Now, get rid of him. I need to put his son to bed. I took a step back, tears flowing freely from my eyes, shaken to the core, unable to stop staring at my dead father. My world swam and rocked, my vision of a streaking blur of color. I felt like I was going to throw up, pass out, scream until I couldn't breathe anymore. Tommy was suddenly looming over me, sweeping me up in his arms. He pressed my shocked face into his shoulder and stroked my hair. As we went into the house and up to my bedroom, I heard a rumble in Tommy's chest. <laughs> June, 1973. How do I describe the following three and a half years? Words don't, can't, make you understand what life was like for my mother and I. My father's murder was covered up by the neighborhood and my mother, despite the crippling pain it must have brought her. When the police eventually came to investigate, on request from his job, a story had already been carefully collaborated by the families. 
I told the police that my father had been cheating on my mother and she had found out and then kicked him out. Lies about arguments heard were told, along with a few scenarios where the neighbors saw my father sneaking out late at night. It was enough to get the police off her street. They saw the pain in my mother's eyes, but misinterpreted the source. Everyone was petrified of Tommy Taffy. The lies told in order to assure safety of themselves and their families. An example had been given. A lesson learned. Listen to Tommy Taffy. Do what he wants. And pray that one day he'd go away and leave our broken community. My father wasn't the only one who had been punished. I noticed a couple of the neighbors sporting broken limbs or bruised faces. I can't even imagine the lies they told the outside world to cover up the truth. Tommy was a haunting nightmare in our lives and we could find no way to get rid of him. The nightly lessons resumed. Just my mother and I now. Sitting on the couch listening to our captor explain how to be good people. I was ten then and it made me sick. Age slowly clarifying just how dismal our situation was. But I kept my mouth shut. I kept it shut for my mother. The memory of my father's execution burned bright in my skull every day. The years that followed my father's death marked a change in Tommy's habits. He now slept with my mother, every night leading her to bed after I was tucked in and told one last lesson about life. I would lay awake for hours, listening to her cry from her room. Sometimes it'd be for a few moments, other times, hours. He didn't always stay with her through the night, though. I remember times I'd wake up and he'd be standing in the dark corner of my room, watching me sleep. His eyes like shining oceans. Other times he'd be staring at me through the crack of my door. He'd stand there for hours just... fucking... watching. Sometimes I'd wake up to him sliding into bed with me, always placing a cool hand over my thigh. Heart thundering, fear ripping apart my insides. I'd always turn away from him, breaking out in cold sweats. I still had growls, my constant source of childlike comfort. I'd hug him to my chest, tears running down my face until either the sun came up or exhaust and shut my brain down. We endured this silently, begging for it to end. July 1974 I was 11. It was my fifth year to the day since Tommy had entered our lives. I sat in the living room, reading a book while my mother prepared supper for us. She was pale and gaunt the long years wearing her to the bone. Her eyes were lifeless these days and had sunk into her sockets, her cheekbones pronounced, skin thinly stretching over them. Growls lay on my chest as I reclined, trying to focus on my book. Tommy was sitting in the chair across from me, watching. I turned a page and jumped as Tommy spoke. You really love that thing, don't you? I turned to Tommy. My book? Tommy shook his head, smiling. No, son. That bear. I looked at growls on my chest and shrugged uncomfortably. I... I guess so. Tommy leaned forward, lacing his fingers together. Put your book down, Spence. Licking my suddenly dry lips, I obeyed. I noticed my mother was watching from the kitchen, looking alarmed. Do you know what love means? Tommy asked. I fiddled with growls, eyes downcast. It, it means you care for someone very much. Tommy shook his head. <sighs> no, no. Good try. He suddenly came and sat next to me, placing a hand on my leg, caressing it. Love means you want to fuck something so bad you'd die if you didn't. I heard my mother drop something in the kitchen, but I didn't dare take my eyes off Tommy. Tommy pointed to Growls. Do you want to fuck your teddy bear? I had heard some kids in school talking about fucking, but I didn't have a clear understanding of what it was yet, so I just shook my head, palms sweaty. Tommy looked confused. Huh. Well, you said you love Growls. So, you don't love him. My mother took a step towards us, but her hands balled into fists but kept her mouth sealed shut, her lips a thin white line. I... I guess I don't love him then. I stammered, feeling Tommy's hand tighten on my thigh. 
Tommy placed his other hand on the back of my head. Why don't you give him a little kiss? See what you think, yeah? I felt embarrassed and humiliated just at the thought, my cheeks burning. I tried to chuckle, like I thought it was a joke, but Tommy slowly pushed my head towards my bear. Go ahead, son. Don't be afraid. He coached. I could feel tears brimming in my eyes as he guided my mouth towards my bear, and I gently kissed its nose, turning away immediately. Do it again. Tommy whispered. Show him how much you love him. Sniffling, tears now rolling down my face, I held up growls and planted a few kisses on his worn nose. My face was flush and my heart was racing. I felt foolish and absolutely terrified. Tommy's hand like a vice grip on the back of my head, urging me on. Lick him a little. Tommy whispered in my ear. I suddenly jerked my head away and threw growls across the room, openly sobbing now. I don't love him. I hate him. I hate him. I covered my face, ashamed, handshaking. I pulled myself into a ball and lay there, sobbing. I felt Tommy get up next to me and turn to my mother. (laughs) It sounds like he's learned his last lesson. I'd be proud of him now if I were you. He's a man now. I looked up at him through tear-soaked eyes. His eyes sparkled. It took five years. He suddenly leaned down and cupped his mouth over my ear. His voice was cold glass. His breath like hot fire. Your little ones will get five years as well, Smith. And with that, he looked at my mother one last time and then walked out the door. My mother rushed me and took me in her arms, comforting me as I cried. Tommy never returned to our home. Time passed and I grew up. I grew up always expecting Tommy to show up again, come barging through our front door, but he never did. The years faded and some of the horror and pain began to fade as well. We were never the same though. How could we be? My mother was a shell of the woman she used to be. The mental torture she had undergone had broken something inside of her she'd never regain. But, God... Did she love me and try to heal the nightmares of those five years? A full year passed before my mother dared ask Megan's mom if Tommy was gone from their home as well. He was. The neighborhood was free. Impossibly, unbelievably free from the monster that had terrorized us for five awful years. I never understood what Tommy's final words were to me. What they meant. Until it was too late. When I turned 25, I married Megan. A year later, we were expecting. You've heard the rest from my poor son. God forgive me for having children. God forgive me. I put my phone down, sighing heavily. I had just been speaking to my father, Spence. He told me he wasn't going to make it to Stephanie's for Sunday lunch tomorrow. He sounded tired, worn, but then again, he always sounded like that. I couldn't blame him. I felt the same exhaustion myself. We had carried it with us for years. The memories we held, the nightmares we had survived. He told me mom wanted to go away, maybe to the mountains for a while. She wasn't doing well these days either. It seemed like every week she was trying a new medication. The nights were the worst. My father had quietly admitted this to me. The tossing and turning, 
the fearful glances at the door, jumping at every sound. For my father and I, the passage of time wasn't enough to erase the fear that was seared into our minds like a brand. Stephanie seemed to be doing the best out of the four of us. She was happily married and her baby twins were almost three months old now. She had named them Jack and Jill. She thought it was cute. It was. Her husband, Louis, was a good guy. He took care of them. A selfless, strong man who put his children and wife before all. I sat in the darkness of my apartment, glancing at the clock. It was almost eleven. I thought about retiring for the night, but instead got up and poured myself a shot of rum. I downed it without even thinking and let the heat settle my worn mind. I went to take a piss and heard my phone ringing from where I had left it on the couch. I zipped up my pants and went to pick it up. I expected it to be my father again. It was Stephanie. Why is she calling me this late? I thought to myself, immediately going to full alert. I placed the cell to my ear. Hello? Steph? It was silent for a few moments. Something rubbing against the speaker. Then, my sister's voice trickled through the line, terrified and thin. Matt. My brow furrowed. Yeah, I'm here. Is everything okay? More heavy breathing than a thick whisper. Matt, he's here. The line went dead. My heart began to race, fear suddenly roaring in the silence. I stood in the darkness, phone pressed to my head, eyes growing wide. No. Jesus Christ. Please, no. Not yet. I immediately redialed Stephanie, but it went to voicemail. As I placed the phone down on the counter, I realized my hands were shaking. I poured myself another shot of rum and threw it back. I began to pace, trembling in the dark, mind spinning. It was everything I had ever feared, but it was too soon. Way too soon. Fuck! I screamed, throwing my glass against the wall, hysteria splintering my throat. Fuck! 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 I collapsed on the couch and tried to call Stephanie again. It rang once. Twice. Then it picked up. Steph. Steph, tell me exactly what's going on. Are you okay? There was no response, but I could hear something in the background, muffled and urgent. Tears were forming in my eyes. Jesus, Steph, please tell me you're okay. Then a voice like cold silk. Hello, Matt. Oh, it has been some time, hasn't it? Recognition blasted through me like an icy wind, swirling through the depths of my mind and ripping apart every horror I had ever experienced. Bile lurched in my stomach and sweat broke out across my forehead. Voice trembling, I asked in a whisper. T Tommy? <laughs> the line went dead again. I stood up, clawing on my hair, vomit threatening my throat. No, 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 this wasn't happening. Please, God, fuck, fuck, fuck. I couldn't stop shaking. The voice on the phone opening up years of suppressed nightmares, tearing the chains and shattering the locks. I collapsed on my knees and vomited on the floor, unable to hold it back any longer. I stared at nothing, bloodshot eyes blinking rapidly. Five more years. No! I screamed, pounding the floor with a fist. I got to my feet and snatched my keys from the countertop. Stephanie only lived a couple minutes away. I wasn't going to let this happen. Not again. I slammed the car into park, panting. Stephanie's house was lit up like a distress beacon, but the drapes were drawn across the front windows. I couldn't see any signs of movement. No shadows. Nothing. I wrung my hands, racking my brain. What exactly was I going to do? What was my plan here? I just knew I had to do something. I wasn't going to let my sister's family suffer like ours had. And what about Louis? He would have no idea what was going on. He would fight back. Oh, no. Taking a deep breath, I opened my car door, the cool night air hitting my face like a splash of water. My sister's street was dark, the quaint line of single-story houses lining the road like blacked-out bricks. 
except for Stephanie's. Rubbing my hands on my pant legs, I approached the front door, heart hammering in my chest like a wild drum. My throat was dry and a voice in my head screamed to just go back home. But I couldn't. Not until I knew Stephanie and her family were okay. Maybe I could... Fuck. Maybe I could what? I was standing before the front door. I ran a hand across my forehead and then knocked. It sounded like gunshots in the night. I pressed my ear to the door but couldn't hear anything through the thick wood. As I raised my fist to knock again, the lights in the house went out. I pounded on the door now, terror and urgency detonating in my chest like a bomb. Steph! Stephanie, it's me, Matt! Please, open the door if you can! Suddenly, I heard the deadbolt turn. I stepped back as the door cracked open, breath rushing from my lungs like a discarded balloon. Two blue eyes shined from the darkness, glowing like crystals of fire. And then a voice, smooth as cream. A little late for a visit, don't you think, Matt? Staring into those burning blue eyes, hearing my name from his foul lips, it took everything I had to keep standing. Where's Stephanie and the babies? Where's Lewis? I finally choked out, frozen on the front steps, unable to look away from his eyes gazing at me from the black. We're all here, just getting reacquainted. Lewis wasn't very welcoming. What have you done? I hissed. (laughs) Suddenly the lights in the house went on and the eyes in the door melted into a face and head and body. A shockwave of horrific memory rocketed through me, almost sending me to my knees. Tommy Taffy looked exactly how I had remembered him from all those years ago. His short blonde hair, the small nub jutting from his face where his nose should have been, the eerie strip of seamless white where his teeth should have been, and his glowing blue eyes, so intense they threatened to drown me. His perfect, impossibly flawless skin gleamed in the light, reminding me of soft plastic. Tommy pulled the door open, gesturing inside with his hand. You came to get your sister, didn't you? From my place on the steps, I could see directly into the kitchen. Lewis was slumped on the floor, motionless by the table. Stephanie was next to him, weeping, clutching at his still body. She looked towards the door and saw me, her eyes widening, desperation shaking in her voice. Matt! Matt, help us! Please! The agony stretching across her face tore me apart. Tears blooming in my own eyes. I wanted to push past Tommy, but he grabbed my shoulder, stopping me. Ah, ah, ah. You saw your sister. No need to get involved. Tommy said, his grip like an iron clamp, digging into my collarbone. I turned to Tommy, one foot in the house. Please. Please leave them alone. Haven't you taken enough from our family? It's time for you to go, Matt. Tommy said, pushing me back outside. Stephanie wailed, screaming my name from her place beside Lewis. I tried to step around Tommy, desperation raking my voice. Please, just let... I was cut off as Tommy suddenly stepped forward and grabbed me by the throat. He slammed me against the side of the house, never releasing his grip. His face was inches from mine, his voice like burning coals, but his face remained calm. I told you to go. Don't make it worse for them. This isn't about you anymore. I gasped as he released me, slumping to my knees in the dewy grass. I watched helpless as Tommy went back inside and slammed the front door. The lights in the house went out, and the screaming began. I sat in my dark apartment, the bottle of rum beside me almost as empty as my gaze. The sun was rising. A soft pink glow tickling the horizon through the window. I hadn't slept, my imagination running rampant. I couldn't let Stephanie live through this. Not again. Not for another five years. Time had hidden the abominations of our childhood from my sister. Tommy entering our lives at an age she could still forget. The twins. He had come back because of the twins. Jack and Jill to continue his reign of terror through the generations of our family. When would it end? How could it end? 
The hours offered no solution, the rum burning in my gut giving no comfort. Suddenly my cell rang, startling me. I blinked and realized the sun now was burning cheerily through the window. How long I had been sitting here. My heart jumped as I saw it was Stephanie calling me. I hurriedly answered. Hello? Steph, are you okay? What has he done? My sister's voice was emotionless and flat. Tommy said it was okay for you to come over for lunch, just like we planned. What did he do to you? I hissed. Her voice never changed. He's feeding the twins. Everything's okay. Steph. I started, but she hung up. I rose and rushed to the bathroom, splashing water over my face. The rum seemed to have no effect on me. My eyes meeting my face in the mirror with surprising clarity. But that did nothing to dilute the fear that plagued my mind. I raced out of my apartment and into my car. As I drove, I found myself becoming sick. Claws dug into my memory and uprooted the past horrors I had experienced at the hands of Tommy. I couldn't let Jack and Joe go through that. I couldn't let Stephanie watch her family slowly get tore apart. A couple minutes later, and I was parking in front of her house, I anxiously got out of the car and went to the front door where I knocked. Tommy answered, a baby in each arm. Hello, Matt. Good to see you at a more appropriate hour. Come on in. Just seeing him touch the children made my skin crawl and my stomach clench, but I shut my mouth and said nothing. I walked past him, and he kicked the door shut behind me, bouncing the babies in his arms and beaming down at them. <gasps> Beautiful children, aren't they? Tommy said softly, staring down into their faces. Where's my sister? I asked a trickle of sweat running down my spine like a ghost. As if to answer, Stephanie came walking down the stairs. Her skin was pale and dark bags hung from her eyes. There was no sign of physical violence, but I knew that Tommy had other ways to punish people. Lunch is ready, she said, tonelessly, her eyes dead. She walked into the kitchen and began setting food on the table. I followed her and then froze. Louis was slumped over the table, breathing heavily. One side of his face was swollen, closing his left eye. Blood leaked from his mouth onto the empty dinner plate before him. His legs had been broken, his shins and ankles twisting along the sides of the chair at angles that turned my stomach. Upon seeing me, he raised his head, trailing drool and blood from the corners of his mouth. Get this monster out of my house. He whispered to me. Before I had any chance to respond, Tommy was sweeping in behind me, cooing down at the babies. Stephanie was like a zombie, placing the streaming platters of food before us and then sitting in the chair opposite her bleeding husband. Jesus, Lewis. I gasped. We need to get you some help. Come on. I'm taking you to the hospital. Tommy looked up at me from the babies. Man, sit down and enjoy the food your sister so lovingly made for you. It would be terribly wasteful to ignore such a feast. As if to lead by example, Tommy took a place at the table, the gurgling, oblivious twinge chirping in his arms. He needs help, Tommy. I insisted, terrified of the words coming out of my mouth. Oh, don't be dramatic, Matt. I suddenly slammed my hand down on the table. I'm taking him to the hospital, goddammit! Immediately, I regretted my sudden aggression. The gasoline fire in my chest was doused instantly as Tommy's shining blue eyes met mine. Wordlessly, Tommy stood and handed Jill to Stephanie, who gratefully accepted her daughter, eyes never leaving me. Tommy took Jack and went to the sink. He turned on the garbage disposal. Horror ripped through my brain like a blazing locomotive. The loud whirring of the blades filled the kitchen and choked the fight from me, replacing it with furious caution. Get away from there! Lewis screamed, <sighs> struggling to stand, but screaming as his broken bones squirmed against his twisted flesh. Tommy lowered the now crying Jack towards the black mouth of the garbage disposal, his eyes never leaving me. It would be a tight squeeze, but I think I could get him to fit. Tommy said, his voice like the edge of a knife. I raised a trembling hand. Stop! Stop! Okay, please, just stop! But Tommy kept lowering the baby, its howling face now inches from the opening. I only need one, Matt. 
Maybe you need a lesson. Maybe you've forgotten how this works. Stephanie was clutching Jill, her eyes bulging from her face, tears silently streaming down her cheeks. No, no! I'll do whatever you want. Please, just stop. Please! I got down on my knees, voice shaking, my own tears of terror pouring from my eyes. Just don't hurt the baby. Don't hurt Jack. Tommy's eyes bore into my skull, examining my words like they were under a microscope. Finally, he turned and switched off the garbage disposal, handing Jack to Stephanie. I let out a shuddered sigh of relief and shakily got to my feet. Tommy took a seat at the table and pointed for me to do the same. I didn't hesitate. You godless fuck! Lewis growled, clenching his fists. I'm gonna kill you. I'm gonna fucking kill you! Tommy turned to him, and I saw his jaw clench. Don't push me, Lewis. It won't end well. Fuck you! Lewis spat. Like lightning, Tommy stood and stepped towards Lewis, sliding his hand into the beaten man's mouth to grip his upper jaw. Without slowing, Tommy heaved Lewis out of his chair and threw him face first into the refrigerator. With a dull thud, Lewis's face erupted in a fountain of blood and shattered teeth as he collided with the hard surface. He slid to the floor, leaving bloody trails in his wake. Face like smooth stone, Tommy lifted him by the hair and dragged him to the oven. He pulled the door down and shoved Lewis's head into the crack. Without hesitating, Tommy began to smash his skull between the oven and his door, each blow crunching into his head and splitting the skin. Stop it, Tommy. Stop it. You're going to kill him. I screamed, leaping across the table. Tommy spun and pointed at the twins. His eyes locked with mine, his voice thundering across the kitchen like a summer storm. It's him or the baby. Who's it gonna be? I collapsed in my chair, eyes wide, entire body shaking. Tears poured from my eyes, my lips twisting and quivering to form words, but only helpless sobs escaped. The twins were howling and Stephanie clutched them to her chest, weeping, shock washing over her in horrified waves. I turned away world rocking, ears filling with screaming and crying as Tommy crushed Lewis's head with the open door. The spittle flew from my lips with each ragged breath I sucked into my lungs, reality bending and darkening. Tommy straightened, panting, observing his work. Blood splatter painted the cabinets and floor, slow trails that oozed like reaching fingers. Stephanie was weeping. Eyes squeezed shut, twins mimicking their mother's sorrow. Tommy ran a hand through his hair, exhaling, his eyes meeting mine. He smiled, shaking his head, like he couldn't believe it. He then turned to Stephanie and motioned for the babies. Give them to me. Clean your husband's mess up. My nails were digging into the tabletop, knuckles white. I couldn't believe the carnage I had just witnessed, the brutal execution of my brother-in-law. I was shaken to the core, my vision spinning in disbelief. Tommy leaned down and snatched the babies from my sister. Go. Put him in the basement for now. Why? Why did you have to do that? Stephanie squeaked between sobs. Why? Tommy began to soothe the twins. Why did you have to do shooting that? Shooting a look at my sister. He wasn't right for this family. Now, clean him up. Tommy walked into the living room, motioning me to follow him. My chair scraped loudly against the floor as I stood, watching my mentally shattered sister begin to drag her husband towards the basement door. Drool leaked from her lips as she whispered loving apologies to the deceased. She was breaking. In a horrific daze, I followed Tommy into the living room, feeling like I was in a dream. I wanted to murder this monster, rip this cancer from my family, but another part of me knew I couldn't. That attempting to do so would just bring more violence. There just had to be a way, though. Tommy had settled the twins and was now watching me. You okay, Matt? I said nothing, my shell-shocked eyes staring into nothing. Tommy nodded. I know this is probably upset. That's why I wanted to talk to you in private. 
I'm worried about your sister and how she's gonna take all this. I'm worried about how it will affect her parenting. My eyes rose to meet his, my voice incredulous. You... You did this. Tommy ignored my accusation. Man, I'd like you to stay here with us for a while. Keep an eye on your sister. Help her through this. I'm afraid it's the only chance we have of settling her mind after such tragedy. My fists were clenched by my sides. One day, someone is going to stop you. Tommy smiled, but there was no humor in it. Careful, man. Just leave my sister alone. Get out of her life. I said through gritted teeth. I can't do that. Tommy insisted. Not with such beautiful children to be raised. In fact, that's the reason I'm here so early. I couldn't wait any longer. I had to see them. His eyes glowed, twin spotlights cutting into the darkness of my mind. I took a step towards him, whispering. What the fuck are you? <laughs> I stayed with Stephanie that night. It had taken her almost three hours to clean up Lewis, and when she was finished, she went up to her bedroom and collapsed. I put the babies to bed after giving them a bottle and stood on the balcony, staring down into the empty living room. Everything felt wrong, like I was dreaming. The shocking events that were slowly twisting my life dug into my brain, unearthing every horror I had spent years burying. A hand rested on my shoulder. I turned to see Tommy, the light in my sister's bedroom glowing behind him. Go. Be with her tonight. It's important she feels the warmth of a man beside her. It will help ease her husband's passing. I said nothing. Just stared into Tommy's smooth face. Every ounce of me screamed to plunge my fingers into his eyes. Tommy pushed me towards Stephanie's bedroom. Go. Wordlessly, I walked down the hall and into my sister's bedroom. I shut the door behind me and went to sit on the bed. Stephanie was under the covers, staring at the ceiling through bloodshot eyes. Her skin was pale and heavy bags stripped down her cheeks. I didn't know what to say, so I said nothing. I laid down next to her and turned off the lamp. After a couple of hours, I blessedly heard the shallow breath of sleep beside me. Good, I thought. Let her mind have a few hours of peace. The deep hours of the night snuck up on me, but I barely even noticed. My mind refused to shut down. Ideas and possible ways of circling my exhausted head, like water circling a drain. Something Tommy had said kept echoing in my mind. I only need one of them. I examined those words, ringing out every possible meaning and scenario they could represent. I didn't like what I found. I glanced at my sleeping sister next to me, her suffering apparent even in slumber. My heart screamed for her and I felt my eyes well up. She didn't deserve this. Not again. Not for another five years. I couldn't watch that. I couldn't let it happen. What was I willing to do to save her? What kind of person would I have to become? How could I possibly live with myself if I... If I did what the darkness whispered? You know how to save her. Something chuckled from the black. Tommy made a mistake tonight. Or was it? Maybe he's testing you. Either way, you know you can't continue like this. You can't live knowing your dear sister is breaking. I covered my face in the dark, tears straining my eyes. What kind of person would I be? At some point in the night, I became aware of something by the bedroom door. I turned my head and saw Tommy watching us through a crack in the door, his blue eyes illuminating the darkness to cast a soft glow across his smiling face. I shivered and turned away. It was hours before I felt his gaze leave me. 
I awoke to a scream. I bolted upright, sleep leaving me in an instant. I didn't remember falling asleep, but the dark gloom from the window told me it was late. I glanced at the clock on the bedside and saw it was almost ten. Rain threw itself against the house, a wind slamming angrily against the windows. Another scream shot me out of bed. It was Stephanie. I looked at the empty bed and my heart began to race. I sprinted out of the room into the hallway. Tommy was marching up the stairs, holding my sister by the hair. She was grasping at her wrists, tears running down her face in agony as he shook her, screaming down into her face. When will you learn? He howled, never slowing his pace. My heart crawled at my throat, and sickness boiled in my stomach. What happened? Tommy, let go of her! Still dragging my sister, Tommy ascended to the top of the stairs. He reached out and palmed my face, throwing me hard against the far wall. Stars exploded in my vision as my head bounced off the sheetrock, sending me to my knees. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I wasn't calling anyone. I promise. Stephanie howled as Tommy pulled her towards her bedroom. The police can't help you. Matt can't help you. Only I can help you. Tommy snarled. He threw her across the room onto the bed and turned back to me. Fury stretched his face and burned in his eyes. Your sister needs another lesson. He growled before slamming the door and locking it. I crawled to my feet, racing to the door. I jiggled the handle and pounded on the wood, screaming, begging. From inside, I heard something crash and then my sister's voice arched and rose, reaching an almost animalistic height of hysteria. Tommy, stop it! Tommy, please! Please leave her alone! I cried, slamming myself against the door. It didn't budge and my sister continued to howl. I spun in the hallway, clawing at my hair, eyes wide. Fuck! Fuck! My heart motored in my chest, and my whole body shook, a sense of maddening helplessness and anguish threatening to overwhelm me. Stop this! My mind screamed, you have to stop this! I pounded the wall, tears rolling down my face. No! 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 No, 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 no! She still has a chance. She can recover from this plague. Do something before it's too late. My mind howled. Breath hitching in my throat. My sister's scream echoing and crashing into my skull. I turned into the twins' room. I squeezed my fists together, world blurring through tear-soaked eyes, and went in. Jack and Jill were sniffling in their cribs, staring up at me with confused scared expressions. I looked down at them, sobbing, placing my forehead against Jill's crib. No. No. No, no, no. I wept. Please. Please. I righted myself and reached down, stroking her soft cheek, snot bubbling from my nose, face a wet mess of agony and mental devastation. I am so sorry, little one, I whispered. Stephanie shrieks, collapsing my willpower. But you can't understand the pain your mother is going through. What you'll have to endure. I love you and Jack with all of my heart. But I love my sister more. I picked up a pillow and placed it over the child's face. It took... 48 seconds for Joe to die. Hoarse cries rattled my chest. Prayers of forgiveness poured from my lips. I went to Jack's crib and killed him. When it was over, I threw the pillow against the wall and slumped down to my knees, raining the floor with tears of horror at what I had just done. My mind cracked, ripping in two, and bleeding sorrow and self-hatred through my body. Suddenly, something was hauling me to my feet. I coughed as a hand gripped my throat and slammed me against the wall. I blinked and stared through grief-stricken eyes into Tommy's enraged face. What have you done? He bellowed, shaking. Through the misery, a deep, murderous hatred blazed in my chest like wildfire. I leaned into Tommy, a voice like hot steel. I'm freeing this family from your shadow. Screaming, 
I smashed my face into it as hard as I could. My vision blinked, the darkness quickly clearing under a storming rage. Tommy howled, stumbling backwards, clutching his face. Something yellow and thick dripped from his mouth. He looked down at it, eyes growing wide. I knew you could bleed. I snarled, wiping the tears from my face. Tommy stared at his covered hand and then back up at me. Fury reigniting. What have you done to the children? I killed your lifeline. I hissed. Before he could respond, I charged him. I threw my body into his, slamming him against the far wall with a heavy thud. The surprise and pain that rippled across his face fueled my sudden murderous hunger. I grabbed his hair and ripped his face to the side, burying my teeth into his soft throat. He screamed as my jaw snapped shut, my mouth filling with warmth and shredded flesh. I spat the mouthful out as Tommy shoved me back, hand going to his gushing throat. His fingers coated with a yellow liquid, pouring down his shirt and chest. I didn't let him recover. I grabbed a lamp and brought it crashing into his skull, bringing him to his knees. I drove a fist under his chin while simultaneously swinging the lamp again, driving the butt directly into his eyes. He howled, falling against the wall, reaching out, desperate. I knelt over him, tossing the lamp aside. My fist thudded into the gaping hole into his throat, summoning new howls of agony. It fueled me, ignited me, filled me with rage. I stood and kicked him onto his stomach. He started to crawl towards the door, but I brought a foot down on his spine, causing him to twist and shriek. Keeping my foot on his back, panting, I leaned down, voice like venom. It's over, Tommy. You motherfucker. Even through the obvious pain, his eyes burning with hatred, his voice hoarse. You can't kill me. There are other families. I reached down and gripped beneath his chin with both hands. But not my family. I pulled back as hard as I could, muscles straining and screaming, howling, thrashing. Tommy's neck bent backwards until the skin in his throat split with a sickening pop. I didn't stop. Sweat pouring from my brow, fingers digging into his skin. With a deafening crack, Tommy's spine broke at the base of his neck. And then he went still. I collapsed onto the floor, gasping, muscles burning. I stared at the motionless body, fresh tears in my eyes. I had done it. I had killed Tommy Taffy. A wave of relief and sorrow rolled through me like a rising tide, hot and cold crashing into each other as the consequences of my actions stabbed me with the needle-thin blades. What have I done? I rushed Stephanie to the hospital, calling the police on the way. I told them that an intruder had broken into the house and murdered Lewis and the children. I didn't wait for the questions. My main concern was getting my unconscious sister medical attention. That day, something in me broke. Something I can never heal or replace. A dark shadow hovers over my soul, a deadly reminder of what I had to do to save my sister. Guilt and anguish, those are the words just compared to how I feel. I don't know if I'll be able to live with myself much longer, but I know Stephanie will live. My dear sister. The news of her children's demise rocked her to the bone. I stayed with her through it all. Those... Long nights in the hospital filled with overwhelming sadness and grief. I told her Tommy had killed them. And it's a lie I would take to the grave. Whenever that may come. And even when the sorrow threatens to kill me, I know, deep down, that Tommy is forever gone from our lives. Because of me. Because of what I did. Our family would die free from the shadow of that monster, Tommy Taffy.
As a police officer, I've seen a lot of things during my time on the force. A lot of awful, sick things. Things that make you wonder if there's any good left in mankind. Things that I've carried with me for years. Things I'll never forget. I've seen acts of human cruelty that exceed any horror you could conjure. But there's one incident that stands out above the rest. One that has haunted me for years and has been the cause of many restless nights. An incident that still causes my breath to hitch in my chest at the mere thought of it. Something that terrifies me to this day. The night I met Tommy Taffy. July 24th, 1987. Shit, we got a 911 call over on Tenor Street. My partner Henry said, leaning across the driver's seat and opening my door. I steadied the two coffees in my hands and ducked down, sliding behind the wheel. I passed the steaming cup to him and sighed heavily. Great. And here I was hoping we'd have a quiet night. What are we walking into? Dispatch said a young girl called it in. Something about a domestic disturbance. Henry replied, taking a cautious sip. <sighs> Fantastic. I love getting in the middle of arguing couples. I sighed. I placed my own cup in the holder and flicked on our lights, pulling out of the gas station and roared down the highway. As we drove... I anxiously tapped my fingers against the wheel. We had been on dozens of calls like this, but each time I felt my pulse quicken. Domestic disputes meant that one of the parties was out of control. Out of control meant unpredictable, and unpredictable meant dangerous. After a couple of minutes, Henry pointed out into the night. There's Tenor. I spun the wheel. Got it. The road was dark and quiet. A neat line of small houses set on quarter-acre plots. I checked the address and then poured into the driveway of a small two-story house at the end of a cul-de-sac. I scanned the surrounding houses, searching for curious neighbors. The street was still and empty. I got out of our cruiser, the warm night air caressing my face, and adjusted my hat. Henry mirrored me on the opposite side of the car, casting a quick glance my way. I don't hear anything. He muttered watching the front of the house. The curtains were closed, but we could see the lights on. I <laughs> probably saw the flashing red and blues and shut the argument down. I snorted, walking up the driveway. Henry joined me, and together we marched up to the front door. Do the honors? Henry asked, waving a hand before us. You sure know how to spoil a guy. I said, raising my fist and pounding on the door. Hello, police. Please open the door. I announced. We paused for a moment as someone moved around inside, the dull thud of footsteps drawing closer. Then there was silence and I thought I could hear someone talking, a male voice. Police, please open the door. I repeated, wrapping my knuckles on the wood. More silence followed a low, muffled conversation. Finally, the door opened a crack. A woman peeked out at us, her face flush. Henry tipped his hat. Evening, ma'am. We've had some complaints about a domestic dispute. Could you please open the door? Everything is fine here. She breathed. Her eyes shifted between the crack to appraise us. Just leave us alone. We're okay. I placed a hand on the door, my voice stern. Ma'am, can we please speak to the man of the house? Shaking, licking her lips, the woman stepped back and pulled the door open. We stepped inside and I noticed the disarray she was in. Her hair was a mess. Her cheeks were red and sweat lined her brow, and she looked absolutely terrified. Henry and I removed our hats, and I gave her a reassuring smile as she closed the door behind us. Evening, officer. I turned to look into the living room, and for a second, my heart stopped. Sitting in a chair, placed in the middle of the room facing us, was a man. But he wasn't a man. His features were off, almost alien. A smile pulled his lips to reveal teeth that weren't teeth, just a seamless stretch of white filling the space along his lips. His nose was just a nub protruding from the center of his face, and his eyes shined the brightest blue. His skin was perfect, poreless, and without a single blemish. His hair was blonde and cut short, and he crossed his arms over a white t-shirt that read, Hi, in red cartoon font. He immediately reminded me of a doll, but not quite. 
Seems like we have a slight misunderstanding. Henry shot me a look that showed he was just as put off by this man as I was. He cleared his throat and stepped forward. <clears throat> Had a call come in that there was some kind of argument going on here. Just stopping by to keep the peace, make sure everything is okay. The man smiled wider. Mary and I were having a slight disagreement. Nothing to call the police over. What's your name? I asked. I suddenly couldn't shake this feeling. This cold, creeping finger running along my spine. My name is Tommy Taffy. I placed my hat back on my head. Okay, Tommy, are you this woman's husband? Tommy raised his thumb and slowly dragged it across his lips, his smile growing wider. Henry cocked an eyebrow. Sir? He's not my husband. The woman behind me whispered so quietly I thought I had imagined it. I turned and saw her, Mary, standing against the stairs, face pale as fresh snow. Henry went to her and placed a hand on her shoulder. Ma'am, are you feeling okay? What's wrong? Her voice dropped even quieter, her eyes bulging and bloodshot. Get him out of here, please. Alarm bells were suddenly ringing in my head and I turned back to Tommy, jumping at the sight of him. He had risen and now stood directly in front of me, that smile still plastered to his face. She's just upset right now. He said softly, his voice like soft butter. She doesn't mean that. I looked at Henry and saw he was suddenly on edge as well. Something about this situation, this strange man, the terror in this woman's eyes, it was off. All off. The finger caressing my spine was turning it into a claw. What did you do with my daughter? The woman hissed at Tommy. Sir, please step back. I said, placing a hand on my holster. Daughter? Was she the one who made the 911 call? Tommy raised his eyebrows at my gesture. Step back. Why, officer, I'm cooperating and trying to resolve the issue. He looked past me at the woman, Mary. I just want to get back to life with my family. Henry put a hand on Tommy's chest and gently pushed him away from me. Sir, I'm going to have to ask you to sit back down until we sort this out. Tommy... Still smiling, retreated a few paces but didn't return to his chair. His eyes bore into Mary, something burning between them. Ma'am, it's Mary, correct? Is there a child in the house? I asked softly, standing in front of her to block Tommy from view. She looked up at me and I saw tears filling her eyes. He took her upstairs. And then she covered her face and quietly sobbed. My heart began to beat faster as I looked at Henry. I'll go. He said, pushing past me. As Henry went to the stairs, I turned back to Tommy. Did something happen that I should know about? Tommy's eyes glowed. <laughs> Sir, did you do something? I asked, taking a step forward. Tommy didn't move. Oh, I've done a lot of things, officer. Henry thundered upstairs and I watched Tommy closely to see if he'd given off some kind of reaction. He just kept staring at me, that smile plastered to his lips. Is there anyone else in the house? I asked Mary, the hairs on the back of my neck rising. She continued to cry into her hands, clearly in distress but managed to pull away long enough to mutter. My husband. My daughter. I'm your husband. Tommy said, shaking his head, grinning. He shrugged and tipped me a wink. She gets a little loopy when she's upset. You know how women are. Suddenly, Mary clenched her fists and began to scream right at Tommy. What did you do to Michael? Where's Lily? What did you do to them? I jumped at her sudden outburst, heart racing, trying my best to piece together just exactly what was happening. Before I could say anything else, I heard Henry cry out from upstairs. Jesus Christ, what the fuck? What the fuck? I released the strap of my holster, fingers sliding around the grip of my service pistol. Confusion and fear collided inside my head, and it left my head spinning. I shot a look back at Tommy, who just grinned, and then I slowly backed up to the front of the stairs. Henry? Henry, what's going on? My partner came into view on the balcony above, eyes wide, face white, 
He leaned over the railing and covered his face with his hands, sucking in air. He was shaking uncontrollably, prayer spewing from his lips in a frantic whisper. Henry! I yelled, keeping my eye on Tommy. Henry pulled his face from his hands, his eyes bloodshot, and pointed at Tommy. Cuff him! Now! And then he was racing down the stairs, still pointing. You sick fuck! How could you do that? How could you fucking do that to that child? Henry bolted past me, and before I could react, he was tackling Tommy to the ground, spittle flying from his lips. You murderous fuck! They rolled onto the floor, grunting, and Henry fought to stay on top. Tommy had stopped smiling, trying his best to resist the onslaught, his mouth a grim line along his smooth face. Mary slumped to the floor, weeping, huddling into herself, panicking, not understanding what was happening. I pulled my gun from my holster and pointed it uselessly at my partner and Tommy. Henry had him flipped over onto his stomach now, and he planted into his back. He retrieved his cuffs and slapped them over Tommy's wrists. You evil bastard! You're gonna die in jail for this! Henry spat, clearly shaken to the core. I stepped forward and pulled him to his feet, trying my best to calm him down. Henry, talk to me. What happened? He grit his teeth, squeezing his eyes shut. My daughter's dead. Tommy started to laugh. <laughs> oh, what a horrible misunderstanding. Despite all appearances, I can assure you she's very much alive. Tommy turned his head back to stare at us. I care deeply about that little girl. I would never kill her. She was just being punished for using the phone. Henry's eyes bulged. Oh my god! Hold on! And then he got back up to the stairs, screaming to hold on. My world was spinning, the events before me unraveling at a speed I couldn't keep up with. I kept my gun pointed at Tommy and glanced at Mary who was curled up into herself on the floor, sobbing. Where's your husband? I asked, desperate to make sense of something. Anything. What the hell is going on here? Mary rocked back and forth, her mind quickly disintegrating under the mental agony she had apparently undergone. She didn't answer, and so I got down on one knee and gripped her by the shoulder, spinning her to face me. Mary, where's your husband? Through tear-streaked eyes, she pointed upstairs, her voice cracking and shaking under an avalanche of sorrow. He took him into the bedroom, I, I think. And then she was lost to me again, retreating back into herself. I pushed the brim of my hat up, mouth dry trying not to look at Tommy who was smiling at me from the floor. Suddenly, Henry's voice blasted down to me from upstairs. Get up here! I need help getting her down! She's still breathing! Hurry! What the hell, I thought, shooting a look at Tommy to make sure he was secure before racing up the stairs. I reached the top and could hear Henry down the hall, struggling with something, but all sound suddenly faded as my eyes absorbed the scene at the opposite end of the hall from Henry. I was staring into the master bedroom, the corner of a king-sized bed poking into view. Four ornate bedposts rose from each corner, and impelled on one was the husband, upside down. His mouth was split open and his lips kissed the footboard, blood pooling at the base. The wood spire disappeared into his throat and reappeared out of his groin. His body hung, completely naked, his skin a mass of bruises and cuts. Blood and shit coated the floor and I took a step back. A scream rising in my throat. What the fuck? What the fuck? What the fuck? I could hear Henry scream my name, but the visceral vision held me like a vice. I felt vomit tickle the back of my throat, but found I didn't have the breath to expunge it from my body. Suddenly, a new cry cut the paralysis. A shrill, high-pitched scream. Mary. Something thudded down below, and... Then I heard a scraping noise like something being dragged across the floor. Mary's screams ceased almost as soon as they had started. Henry was howling to call for backup, call for, backup. for EMTs, for but EMTs my mind was beginning something. to strand into the horrors I was experiencing. I blinked and felt dizziness rock me, and I had to catch myself on the wall to keep myself from falling. I stumbled forward towards the balcony and looked down at where I had left Tommy. It was gone, along with Mary. Tommy's cuffs lay twisted and broken on the floor. Jesus Christ, what the fuck is happening? I sputtered, and then the power went out. I heard Henry yell in surprise and confusion as I backed up against the far wall, stumbling in the complete darkness. A voice in my head told me that things had just escalated to a level I couldn't contain any longer. Turn the lights back on! Turn the lights back on! 
and recalled. Feeling like I was in a daze, I walked forward and found the railing again. I leaned down into the black, listening for some clue as to where Tommy had gone, my heart thumping in my ears. And then, from the abyss below, <laughs> I stumbled back and crashed down the hall towards Henry and the girl, hands groping and grasping in front of me like a blind man. I found a door and could hear Henry breathing in front of me. I dropped to my knees and called out to him. Suddenly, light blinded me and I raised my hand to my eyes. Henry lowered his flashlight, his face pale and terrified. What the hell is going on? He hissed. I started to answer but stopped when I saw the little girl he was holding in his arms. She couldn't be more than five years old. Rope twisted and coiled around her body in knots and weaves that seemed endless. Her eyes were closed and her mouth was sealed with duct tape. I noticed her tiny cheeks were bloated like her mouth was filled with something. I reached out and ripped the tape off, my fingers coming away bloody. Slowly, something began to ooze out of her mouth in a mixture of blood and saliva. Oh my god. Oh my god. Henry whispered, voice shaking. Dozens and dozens of sharp tacks poured from her lips and dripped onto the carpet. My eyes met Henry's and we shared a look of absolute horror. Gently, Henry reached into her mouth and pulled the remaining ones away, tossing them aside with a disgusted grimace. What kind of a monster does this? I whispered. That's not the worst of it. Henry said, shaking his head. Look. He lifted her tiny yellow skirt up and I felt all take a life drain from right my again. body in a rush of cold mental agony. What did he... How? I mumbled, feeling a lump of fury and sorrow rise in my chest. Henry lowered her skirt. It's going to take a lot to get her right again. Suddenly, from the black beyond the door, we heard the creak of wood as someone ascended the stairs to the second floor. I pulled my gun from its holster and Henry clicked his flashlight off, shuffling against the wall and throwing me a terrified look. Kill that fucker. Henry whispered. I stood the pistol grip growing sweaty in my hands. With my back against the wall, I peeked out into the dark hallway. I heard something whisper from the shadows by the top of the stairs. Officer down. Officer down. <laughs> I pulled my flashlight from my belt and readied it in my hands, bringing it under the pistol and pointing it towards the voice. Do it! Henry growled. I clicked the light on, heart sputtering and prepared to shoot. But there was no one there. I swung the beam of light around, jumping at every shadow, but the hall remained empty. I licked my lips and stepped out towards the balcony, finger tied against the trigger. Where are you? I whispered to myself, a bead of sweat rolling down my spine. I continued down the hall and stared out over the railing at the foyer below. Everything remained silent and still. Not a whisper or sound. Backup is on its way. Henry called softly from behind me. I turned and retreated back to the bedroom. We needed to get the hell out of this house. I clicked my light off and knelt down beside Henry and the little girl. He shifted her in his arms and passed her to me. I gently accepted the girl, staring down at her bloody pale face. She looked like she was dead, tears suddenly budding in my eyes, and I squeezed them shut, shaking my head. I know. Henry whispered, his voice cracking. Did you see him out there? Did you see Mary? Where did they go? A voice answered from the end of the hall, from the bedroom where the husband was impaled. I'm afraid she had an accident. Henry and I jumped at the sudden noise and turned our heads to stare out into the dark. Two blue eyes glowed at us from the end of the hall, shining like cobalt diamonds. Mary tumbled down the basement stairs and broke her neck. Tommy cooed, chuckling. <laughs> This whole night is turning into a disaster, I'm afraid. Before I could say anything, Henry was on his feet, snarling and pulling his pistol free. He lunged forward and pulled off three shots toward where the eyes were. Darkness swallowed up the blue and we heard the bastard still chuckling from the other room. Stay here! Henry growled. He stepped out into the hall and closed the bedroom door behind him, enveloping me in complete dark. Before the door swung shut, I saw the red and blue light of our backup arrive and spill into the house from downstairs. Henry's footsteps started down the hall and I heard him yelling in fury for Tommy. Tommy. His voice became muffled as he entered the far bedroom and then complete silence swept the house once again. 
so sudden that I sucked in my breath like I was trying to escape. I counted the drum of my heartbeat. One. Two. Three. Four. F the bedroom door before me exploded in a shower of splinters as Henry was hurled through it, face first. He soundlessly crunched in the opposite wall and I heard the fatal stamp of his spine severing. I cried out, horrified. My breath rushing back into my lungs in a wave of terror. Get out, get out, get out. I gripped the little girl in my arms and stood, sweat staining the collar of my shirt. I licked my dry lips and gripped my teeth as I heard the creak of wood as Tommy descended the stairs again, his voice floating back up at me. Officer down, officer down. <laughs> I crept down the hall and saw through the front windows over the railing that two officers who had been sent over were now approaching the front door. Before I could call out, Tommy had flung the door open, a smile plastered to his face. What seems to be the trouble? He asked casually, swinging the door closed behind him, obscuring my view. Knowing I had precious seconds, I hoisted the unconscious girl over my shoulder and flew down the stairs. From outside, I could already hear someone screaming. I turned in the darkness and fled to the kitchen, blinking back sweat as panic grasped my throat with an iron grip. I bumped into a wall and felt my shoulder wince in pain, but I ignored it, desperately searching for a back exit. There! A sliding glass door! I shifted the girl in my arms and pulled the door open, stepping out into the night, gasping with relief as the warm air dried the sweat on my forehead. I quietly slid the door closed behind me and heard Tommy enter the house once again, keeping low. I shifted my way around the side of the house, ever since cranked to eleven. As I made my way to the front yard, the police car that came come to our aid drifted into view. The two officers lay dead across its hood, their throats ripped out. Jesus Christ! I cried softly, voice straining. My mind was exhausted, mess of heightened fear and crushing trauma, every ounce screaming for release. Run. I said to myself. Run, go now before he finds you. Taking a deep breath, I bolted from the corner of the house down the driveway towards my patrol car. My feet pattered over the grass and then clacked against the asphalt as I fled, reaching the car in seconds. I threw the side door open and slid the girl inside, shooting a terrified glance over my shoulder. After she was secure, I raced around to the driver's side and practically tore the door open. I collapsed into my seat and brought the core roaring to life. As I slammed the gears into reverse and hit the gas, I saw the front door open. I saw all the front doors open, every single house lining Tenor Street. I shifted into drive and floored it, the tires squealing. As we accelerated down the road, I watched in absolute horror as Tommy Taffy stepped out every single house, a twisted smile lining his lips. My God. I whispered. He's infected the entire neighborhood. I hit the corner and the rubber screamed beneath me as I gunned us away from the nightmare, away from the carnage. Away from Tommy Taffy. It's been 30 years since that awful night. Not a day goes by that I don't think about the depravity and the horror I witnessed. How do you explain such bizarre violence and terror to someone who hasn't been exposed to such things? You can't, really. And so I suffered the memories in silence. No trace of Tommy was found after the incident. By the time I got the little girl to the hospital, screaming into my radio the entire time, the neighborhood was gone. Yes, gone. That monster burned it all to the fucking ground. Every home, every house, every person, the entire street. I heard the report a couple hours after I rushed the girl into the ER. I remember standing outside the hospital, blood still staining my hands and seeing the horizon glow from the blaze. What oh, hell I've carried with me. But at least it doesn't all end in misery. I've stayed in touch with the little girl I saved that night. Blessedly, she survived and has found joy in her life. I don't know how she recovered mentally from that nightmare, but she has. I visit her and her husband every now and again. She really is amazing. I was over at their house a couple days ago and they told me the most wonderful news. They told me that they're going to be parents soon.